Good morning and welcome to the 257th annual meeting for St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut, and the first virtual one that we've ever had. I'd like to begin with prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be present with us as we take counsel for the renewal and mission of this year's church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So uh, just a few words uh, for how we're going to do this in a Zoom annual meeting. Uh, I'm going to ask for a motion and for a second for three opening pieces of business, for three opening resolutions. And you can move or second those resolutions by taking your raised hand, which is not at the bottom of your screen. Now, once we have all three of these resolutions moved and seconded, uh, Jill will launch a poll for you to vote yes or no to these three questions. Uh, now, you may need to scroll down to go through all three of these questions in order to find the submit button. I know this from experience. Uh, and then after we do these first three resolutions, then uh, Stan Torty, our senior warden, will introduce the resolutions about the extension of terms that was circulated to the parish and posted on our website. Uh, again, I will ask for a motion in a second. And again, you can offer a motion, the second, uh, and also uh, by raising your right hand, your, your Zoom hand here. Uh, there will be an opportunity for discussion before voting. Uh, if you'd like to make a comment or to ask a question, please type in the Q&A box or click raise hand to be unmuted and to speak. And when discussion is included, is, is, uh, excuse me, when discussion is concluded, not included, when discussion is concluded, uh, the poll will be launched uh, and then you can vote. And while you're voting, we are then going to be having uh, reports from uh, Suzanne and Rick, who are going to be speaking to us uh, about our annual pledge campaign this year. And then Lauren Clancy, our treasurer, is going to be speaking with us about the finances. And then uh, finally, batting cleanup, uh, Stan Twardy whose childhood hero is Stan Musial. So of course, Stan should be bad in cleanup. Uh, and then there will be time for questions uh, for all of us, for all the presenters at the end. And if you have a question at that point, uh, if you have a comment, you can do that by uh, clicking on the Q&A box or you can raise your hand during that question period and we will, we will uh, have a moment, you'll have a moment to speak with us. Now, uh, just a word about eligible voters. Of course, uh, you know, uh, when the church built their constitution and their canons and this parish church built their bylaws, no one ever expected to be doing this uh, virtually over Zoom, which was not invented at that point, right? So let me just say a word about who is eligible and how that works. Uh, so uh, you must be uh, 16 years old in order to vote in a parish election or uh, to, to proffer your vote in anything in the parish. Uh, and you must be listed as a baptized member of St. Mark's and be a, a financial co contributor of record sometime in the preceding year. And uh, we used to say you must be a faithful communicant having taken communion at least three times during the past year. But of course, spiritual communion counts. And how many more spiritual communions we've had this year? What a beautiful witness. Uh, and also we ask uh, that somebody be a faithful member of our parish for at least six months before the meeting. Okay, so there it is, folks. Those of you who are uh, longtime veterans of these meetings have heard everything I have just said, and you've heard it over and over and over. So now I would like to uh, propose the uh, three motions. Uh, again, you can raise your hand, your Zoom hand, uh, in order to second. May I have a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of last year's annual meeting? Now, may I also have a motion to dispense with the reading of the role of eligible voters? And thirdly, may I have a motion authorizing the wardens, treasurer, and director of operations to borrow funds as necessary for the financial stability of St. Mark's Parish? And I know, Father Peter, that we had second to all those raised hands. So all those motions were seconded. Wonderful. Okay. In just a moment, Jill will post a way for you to vote on those three motions. 
Please note once again uh, that you need to scroll down into the third motion uh, in order to find the submit button, which you can then get after you have voted on all three of the motions. I'm aware that uh, many of you are just joining in now. And if you missed the opening prayer and you missed the welcome, welcome to the 257th annual meeting of St. Mark's Episcopal Church. And we prayed the prayer that we pray before every meeting at the church. It's found in the back of the Book of Common Prayer. It's prayer number 12 when you look at those prayers. Uh, we are about our business uh, with the first three motions that we have every year. Uh, meetings. Uh, and now, uh, as these, uh, as the vote is being taken, uh, in just a moment, uh, Stan Tuarity uh, is going to introduce the motion uh, that so many of you have all heard about as we have publicized about keeping our leadership in place during this time of pandemic. Thank, thank you, Father Peter. Uh, as Father Peter, uh, Junior Warden Mark Thorsheim, and I wrote to you in our December 14th letter, uh, the vestry has approved a proposal to extend the terms by one year of the officers, vestry, convention delegates, and nominating committee. Uh, the vestry uh, did so for two reasons, both uh, attributed to the pandemic. First, there's a practical problem. Um, while we're able to vote yes or no, as we've just did on these three resolutions, three business resolutions, uh, our bylaws require uh, three nominees for each of the two open spots on the vestry. So for four vestry members, there'd be six nominees. Uh, we do not have the technology uh, to uh, have a secret ballot uh, in, in this uh, case, uh, given the Zoom. It's one of the limitations with the Zoom. Secondly, uh, and as importantly, uh, this will allow the parish to, uh, to uh, capitalize on the experience of the current uh, representatives as we face the uncertainties that continue uh, in 2021 as a result of the pandemic. Um, as the resolutions are put on the screen, I will remind you of who the leaders are for whom we are voting. Um, I'm the senior warden. Mark Thorsheim is the junior warden. Lauren Clancy is the treasurer. Susan, Suzanne Harrison is the clerk. On the vestry, uh, we have Least Least, Maureen Mayer, Eileen Kennedy, Lori Wyckoff, Jack Donahue, Brian Hetherington, Emily Morgan, Janet Prill, Lauren Clancy, Suzanne Harrison, Stage Grimes, and Michelle Ernst. The nominating committee consists of Cyra Borsi, Tim Dan, Jane Hetherington, Kathleen Corbett, David Kalal, and Margaret Roscoe. And our two diocesan convention delegates, uh, alternates, I should say, are Charlene Berardino and Amanda Sutton. Um, the actual resolution, this is the, the, the whereas clauses are on the screen now, uh, and this is sets up the actual resolutions. And if you turn to the second page, please, Joe, uh, to the actual resolutions. Uh, what the resolutions would do uh, is to, um, if approved, uh, the resolutions would provide that the officers, delegates, and nominating committee uh, will extend their terms by one year each. Um, for the vestry, what would happen is if the resolutions are approved, the vestry class with the term that would end in 2021 will now serve to 2022. Similarly, the vestry class, which would have expired in 2022 would be extended to 2023. And the class of 2023 will be extended until 2024. The vestry uh, did consider uh, the possibility of extending the class of 2022 only, I'm sorry, yeah, 2022 only, but that would result in the election of two classes of a uh, total eight of 12 vestry members in 2022. The vestry concluded that that would be too disruptive for the orderly governance of the parish of business and affairs. Uh, so the determination was made to extend all terms uh, for one additional year. Uh, are there any questions at this time about the resolutions? Uh, Stan, perhaps we'll do this. Why don't we have a motion and a second and move the resolution and then have discussion. Does that work for everybody? 
So can I have a motion to receive uh, these resolutions and to vote on those? Can I have a second, please? Okay, thank you for that. Um, if you have questions or comments, uh, please use the Q&A box uh, or click to raise your hand uh, and uh, one of our administrators will be able to unmute you. I think that's Jill or Justin. Okay, hearing and seeing uh, no uh, issues here. Uh, may I please have a, a show of hands? Uh, I, oops, I'm gonna pause here. Um, uh, Jill, are you going to uh, put up a vote here for this? Okay. Um, So there's no Q&A, there's no hands. Uh, and Jill, if you would please put up the resolution so that we could vote on that resolution. And while that is happening, uh, let's turn to Rick and to Suzanne uh, to introduce to us uh, where we are with our annual pledge campaign. And as we do that, I just wanna say uh, how astoundingly grateful we are to you, Rick, and to you, Suzanne, uh, for your year in and year out devotion to this. The work that you do is so fundamental to who we are and God bless you. Uh, and thank you. So I look forward to your thoughts. Thank you, Father Peter. Um, as you mentioned in your sermon this morning, what a year it's been. I'm Suzanne Harrison and as stewardship co-chair, I'm pleased and honored to report that our 2021, or excuse me, 2020 annual appeal has not fallen short despite the uncertainty in today's world. The ongoing support and generosity of the parish has allowed us to adapt and thrive as a church and community of faith when we need it the most. The healing role of our ministry has never been so vast or important as we contend with the repercussions of the pandemic and the intersection of race and faith. Thanks to all of you, we were able to continue to provide the incredible clergy, staff, and lay leaders of the church the resources necessary to expand God's missions beyond the church doors and begin to affect change in our society. We are blessed with a vibrant church and a robust vision for the future and are so grateful for your continued generosity. Now I'll pass the baton to my co-chair, Rick Piperato, who will give a closer look into the progress of the 2020 annual campaign. Good morning. Um, Jill, can you go to the, the, the second slide, please? Here you can see uh, the two preceding pledge years of 2019 and 2020, the annual stewardship appeal, which resulted in 1.55 and 1.56 million in gifts. This slide illustrates the different composition of these gifts that come in the form of pledges, pledge overpayments, and non-pledge gifts. While pledge payments and collections in 2020 were over 60,000 less than in 2019, the difference was more than made up for by higher pledge overpayments and non-pledge gifts. As we know, circumstances can change from year to year. We are so thankful for a parish community that always does what they can and are blessed by those who do more in challenging times. In the lower right-hand corner, you can see the 51,000 plus of gifts to the 2020 Easter offering. In spite of not being able to gather for Easter, our parishioners donated almost 10 times the amount that we traditionally receive for flowers and music to support the church in these challenging times. Next slide, please. Here is a view that reflects the continued progress we have made in the number of households pledging and pledge amounts over the last four years. The percent of households offering a formal pledge is over 62% of our official parish membership. When including the non-pledging gifts and plate contributions, we have a very high proportion of our membership who are supporting the ministries of our church. This is extraordinary and reflects a vibrant 
and healthy parish and strong leadership by Father Peter and his team, the vestry, and the many members who lead and actively participate in our numerous ministries. Next slide, please. In spite of the tremendous headwinds and challenges our community faced during the 2021 Stewardship Appeal, we are forecasting that total gifts and from pledges will be flat to 2020 at approximately 322, a significant accomplishment that allows Father Peter and the vestry to budget appropriately for the coming church year. While there still is work to be done to finish this year's appeal, we are not forecasting overpayments nor non-pledge gifts in order to reach last year's level of giving. Next slide, please. And finally, a few highlights from this year's annual appeal. We have 21 new pledging households, including four pledges from new members and three from newcomers. 84 households increased their pledges over last year and 72% of all of those who have pledged thus far have increased or stayed at the same level. And as a group, those who increased their pledges over the prior year did so on average by 3%. Wow. So the next page, please. Suzanne and I have been blessed to work with a most extraordinary team who comprise the stewardship committee, including Father Peter, Jill Sakoulis, and Laura Watt. We did the easy work while they have done all the heavy lifting. We're so appreciated, appreciative of your guidance and tireless efforts. Stewardship success rests on the strength and vibrancy of our parish family, the love and care we share for one another and our surrounding community, and most importantly to our commitment to go and make disciples who live a deeper life in Christ, a more holy communion with one another, and a greater love for the world. Uh, thank you, Rick, and thank you, Suzanne, uh, you know, two of the leaders of the holy people of God here. We just love you and just love the work that you do. So grateful for it. Uh, and there is no doubt that uh, the work that you do uh, is joined with Laura Watt. I just want to have just to just say that, Laura, uh, quiet amongst our staff uh, or quiet uh, in, in the church is, is just a real force behind things. So thank you, Laura. Uh, okay, so Lauren, um, we are we are uber grateful to you and to Dave Kalal, your assistant, and for all the work that you do. So show us where we are. Great, thanks, Peter, and good morning. I've got four topics to share with respect to the Ministry of Finance. First, we'll explore St. Mark's financial strength by looking at the foundation upon which we operate through our balance sheet, including our endowment. Second, I'll share a perspective of our, of our financial health which includes operating statement results for 2020 and our vestry approved budget for 2021. Third, I'll provide a, a brief status update on our financial capital, sharing an update on our capital projects, utilizing the funds raised from our Empower, Empower the Parish campaign. And finally, I'll touch on the parish's financial resources of experience and oversight and close with our financial management initiatives looking forward. So Jill, if we could turn to slide three, please. Let's look at uh, St. Mark's financial strength as measured by our balance sheet. At year end, we held 15 million in total assets. St. Mark's remains in the enviable position of having a very strong balance sheet with a solid capital base, a healthy endowment, a conservative balance of cash reserves and no long-term debt, placing us among the top in Episcopal churches in Connecticut in terms of financial strength. The balance sheet has three primary pillars. The red segment on the circle on the left represents our endowments and trusts, which total 7.4 million, representing 53% of our assets. Property building and equipment in blue remains steady and represents the land, church buildings, three clergy homes and cemetery totaling 4.7 million or 34% of our total assets. The light blue and purple segments represent the cash and market marketable securities that we hold for operating expenses, expenses and capital investments. 
We also track our accounts receivable from pledge commitments made at the end of each year on behalf of our annual stewardship campaigns as represented on green in the chart. Year over year, the balance sheet has increased slightly due to changes in receivables, use of capital campaign funds, and investment performance re returns. Let's now look at our endowment more closely. In spite of market turbulence in the second quarter last year, endowment and trust funds are up 8.3% after distributions. The performance and allocation of the assets is monitored by the DIOS and De Donations and Bequests Board and St. Mark's Investment and Endowment Committee. Our accounts are managed alongside the endowments of the Episcopal Church of Connecticut and 120 Connecticut-based churches by U.S. Trust who oversee our endowments portfolio. In addition to our managed endowment monies, we are also the beneficiary of an interest in the Lancaster Trust. The current asset allocation is approximately 64% equities, 31% fixed income, and 5% cash and others. In terms of performance, the DND portfolio generated a 13.3% return this year. Looking over the three years, the endowment has returned 8.1%, and over the last five years, 9.5%. The Lancaster Trust, over which we have no active control, had just slightly lower returns. Last year, the Investment Endowment Committee recommended and the vestry approved a 5% annual draw from the endowment to support our operations. For 20, uh, 2021, we've also approved a 5% draw. The goal of um, uh, the endowment is to support our operations while not eating into the corpus of the endowment. The draw funded about 14% of our operations this year. So let's turn to the cost of our operations. We've consolidated our operating expenses here from close to 50 individual line items to five categories. As you can imagine, the majority of our expenses center on our personnel. Approximately 63% of operating expenses represent compensation and benefits for clergy and staff plus musicians, section leaders, and hourly child care services provided during Sunday services. Other buckets of expenses include 12% for IT general and admin, 12% for buildings, grounds, utilities, and insurance, 9% for diocesan common mission support, and 4% for ministries and outreach. This year, given the pandemic, we tightened our belts and saved on compensation and benefits by not filling two vacant positions, the Director of Youth Ministries and a part-time sexton. Our 1099s are also down due to not needing part-time babysitting. In addition, some of our other expense, lines, other expense line items were down, such as supplies, things like paper or goods for coffee hour, travel, utilities, and flowers. We prudently increased certain expense, expenses, such as streaming equipment, grounds and building and snow removal, given the move to virtual and outdoor church. We were able to manage uh, our discretionary expenses very conservatively. Overall, we anticipate our 2020 expenses will come in around $27,000 less than in 2019. In 2020, we anticipate expenses to increase by about 38,000 as we anticipate filling the vac vacancies I previously mentioned, at least for part of the year as well as merit salary increases and a 5.5% medical rate increase. So how do we fund our expenses? There are five primary sources, including pledge payments, non-pledged gifts and contributions from Sunday Plate in blue, which represent 77% of our income. Our endowments in purple, as I mentioned previously, represent an important 14% of our income. Donations in red and green represent 8% and include income coming from financial support of our music ministry, flowers, weddings, funerals, and facility rentals, and special gifts to support our full complement of clergy. Mayfair in light blue on the chart to the right is unfortunately not represented in the pie chart this year, and it has left a $100,000 gap in our financials in 2020 and potentially will again in 2021. Finally, interest income has provided some income, although given where rates are, only a very small portion. As we look to 2021, we are conservatively projecting a decrease in pledge payments, gifts, plate, and donations, 
which are offset by drawing 160,000 of the remaining $193,000 new clergy gift, as well as a 5% draw on the endowment. We assume no Mayfair and no additional fundraising activities in this scenario. Let's now look at income and expenses together. As you know, we strive each year for a balanced budget. If you recall in 2020, we had a surplus, which we utilized in 2018 for one-time discretional expenses, including Francis, our pastoral pup, long deferred buildings and ground repair and maintenance and other ministry initiatives. You can see that uh, for 2019, we achieved a, valid, a balanced budget, but we took down reserves to pay for one-time legal expenses that were incurred for work around the Waveney Life Care Network's proposed senior housing development adjacent to the St. Mark's campus. Those legal costs carried into early 2020. During the pandemic, we applied for and received $285,000 in funding through the CARES Act Payroll Protection Program, which helped us keep our staff employed this year. 215,000 of which went to St. Mark's and 70,000 to the preschool. The day after Thanksgiving, we received the good news that we were granted forgiveness for those funds, making them a grant. We've been able to utilize funds raised in prior years to address outflows during the pandemic, notably continuing our, to fund outreach grants. Rather than disperse all the monies we raised during the 2019 Mayfair to outreach in 2020, we prudently decided to split the payout over both 2020 and 2021, knowing that we wouldn't have a Mayfair in 2020. Finally, we, we look at 2020 and 21 uh, on a combined basis, given the, given the ongoing pandemic. Over the two years, we anticipate having a balanced budget through utilization of PPP grant and employing dedicated reserves and donations for specific purposes to sustain the mission of the church. In summary, at the end of 2021, we'll have utilized our full PPP grant, drawn down on most of our new clergy gift, and we'll likely need to creatively prepare to fill an operating gap in 2021, 2022. Now let's take a look at our general reserves and operating cash. Um, operating cash and general reserves at the end of 2020 stood at approximately 730,000. Monies are still moving around, um, as we have uh, bills coming in and we're still receiving funds. So year, the year-end books haven't been closed officially yet. This year, we received a $50,000 donation to the new clergy gift, which puts the total gift at 350,000. The balance of the gift currently stands at 193,000. As I mentioned, we anticipate drawing 160,000 of it in 2021. We anticipate reserves and operating cash will fall to approximately 440,000 at the end of 2021. As a rule of thumb, we aim to keep three months of expenses as reserves, which would equate to $550,000 on a $2.2 million budget. As we move into 2021, we will need to keep a close eye on liquidity and look to rebuild our reserves. Now let's look at our capital plan. It's, it's important to note that uh, our operating budget does not include the capital expenditures needed to keep our properties and grounds maintained. We have a capital budget that is separate from the operating budget and which is also uh, funded through capital raises. We still have 622,000 left from our Empower the Parish campaign that we anticipate using entirely in 2021. We projected last year in 2020 that we'd spend approximately $730,000 of CapEx. But given the pandemic, we conservatively moved into cash conservation mode. We spent 237,000, mainly on paving our parking lot, partial replacement of the obsolete sound system in the church, indoor air quality upgrades in the church, and engineering for the HVAC project in our offices in Gray Gables. Looking ahead into to 2021, we anticipate spending close to $690,000 in capital. On average, it costs between three and 400,000 each year for us to maintain our buildings and grounds. Given the low spending in 2020, we'll have additional needs in 2021. Our main capital expenses in 2021 will be in overhauling the HVAC and Gray Gables, the church offices, for better efficiency, air quality, and overall working environment. And finally, our 22 year old beloved truck has given out and we'll need to replace it this year. It's possible that something else could break or give out, so our capital plan will stay fluid throughout the year. 
in addition, we may be able to apply for historic preservation grants in some cases that will help to offset the costs. Let me briefly uh, touch on the preschool, if we can flip to the next slide. I want to highlight that our preschool is fiscally sound, managed by its own preschool board, and provides our parish with rental income and capital investments. Our thriving school operates on the basis that the education process should address all areas of learning, social, emotional, spiritual, physical, and intellectual. They have 13 teachers serving 66 students ages two to five. COVID impacted a portion of the spring term last year when we were unable to operate in person. As you can imagine in this age group, remote learning is difficult and as such a partial tuition reimbursement was applied. Over the summer, the preschool made a big investment to support in-person operations during the pandemic environment. The preschool was also able to take advantage of the PPP funding and we kept our teachers employed throughout the pandemic. The net effect of tuition refunds and PPP grant was that was a flat net surplus on a year over year basis of 24,000. Finally, I want to close uh, by acknowledging the that financial management is indeed a team effort. Each of the individuals listed on this slide um, participate in, in a process that oversees portions and or the whole of our financial operations and statements. A measure of our financial strength is a talent and time commitment made by our finance and inv investment and endowment committees, other boards, committees and staff, including the outreach commission, the property committee, the preschool board, the stewardship committee, our plate counters in the vestry. And it is with sincere and grateful thanks, we commend their service and support. Now let's talk about our accomplishments uh, in 2020 and what we're looking for, uh, forward to this year. We, uh, this year we reviewed the Finance and Investment and Endowment Committee membership. We updated the charters and resolutions and created an investment policy statement. In preparing our audit, we addressed the classification of total net restricted assets and put in place new controls re resulting in another clean audit opinion. Finally, we pro procured the CARES Act loan and received forgiveness. As we look to 2021, we'll put in place a strategic plan to sustain our mission through endowment, fundraiser, or other means, continue to plan for capital needs, conservatively manage our expenses to maintain a balanced budget, We'll review our endowment investment manager and continue to research a revolving credit facility for our liquidity needs. I'm happy to take questions at the, at the end of the, the session or feel free to reach me via email. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you Lauren. And thank you for your report uh, and all your hard work as treasurer. And thank you, David Kalal, for serving as the uh, assistant treasurer. Uh, as you can see from Lauren's report, we are in very good hands uh, financially and very good shape financially. Also, I want to thank you, Suzanne and Rick, for your report and your leadership. Father Peter for the outstanding State of the Parish sermon. And a shout out to Rob Schwartz for his uh, work on the video that was just an outstanding video uh, as for today's sermon, but also uh, during the course of all of our streaming services. He's just been wonderful. I want to thank all of you out there for what you have done for our community. Your support in time, talent, and finance has been outstanding and invaluable. Last year in my report, I touched on four things. First was the Waveney proposal for the senior housing complex at the south end of the Great Lawn. The second was a governance review uh, for the voting for vestry uh, and perhaps other governance issues. The need, uh, the case for and the need for the three clergy members we have, and also talked about the talent that we have in our community. So I'll look at what happened and we'll look forward. Uh, the Waveney proposal has been withdrawn. Uh, and as importantly, or perhaps even more importantly, we continue our outstanding relationship with Waveney. We, we are integral friends uh, and we have been able to uh, survive the disagreement on that in great shape. And I think our relationship is even stronger than ever. They are, they are very good friends of ours. Uh, the governance initiative uh, has been put on hold uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, that's something that we feel that we need to have interactive discussion about any change in governance uh, before moving forward and that uh, in-person town hall meetings will be better uh, able to explore that. Uh, and the uh, pandemic has underscored 
the importance of our clergy and also showing the talent of our parish uh, with all of those who out there who are helping people in need. Uh, we were able to uh, pivot with great agility this past year uh, and provide to those in need in a difficult world. Uh, we have been a community of love in the, in the broken and difficult world in which we now are. We appreciate your generous support, which has enabled us to provide help to those in need. Um, we have moved from, been able to move from a largely in-person community uh, in, here centered in New Canaan to a worldwide community. As Father Peter pointed out, we have folks who join us regularly from Italy, Germany, and Russia. Um, but there's been a lot of hard work behind this. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Rob Schwartz uh, has worked tirelessly uh, on the uh, streaming and Ned Sexton has just done a tremendous job uh, as with the virtual organ recital, a virtual organ program with the virtual choir. Uh, and I'm proud to say for Ned that he will be the uh, inaugural performer at a virtual organ recital at the American Cathedral in Paris uh, this upcoming Friday. Uh, and I'll urge you to who can join to, to watch him. Thank you, Ned, for everything you've done. Um, but while we have grown to a international uh, audience, we have really remained committed to our base here. As Father Peter pointed out, we had Mike Handler uh, uh, for 18 weeks uh, talking about where the pandemic was, what was going on, and how we could react with it. Uh, Least Least and Tom Jones had, uh, had two wonderful programs or wonderful programs on the uh, post George Floyd uh, shooting. Um, and our clergy has been very busy with programs, Peter's vlogs, Justin's class, Jules' class on civility, uh, and Elizabeth's bite-sized uh, Bible classes that she's been doing. The staff has also been keeping very busy behind the scenes, and you, uh, Father Peter noted the community of hope, but there's so many other organizations within the, uh, our parish and our community uh, that have just been doing an outstanding job. Uh, what I think is behind the scenes uh, that's not so apparent is the time and energy that the clergy staff and you have been spending to help others. There have been countless touches by our clergy, staff, and parishioners to those out in the community in need. Uh, you know, uh, Father Peter talked about a few of them, but the, you know, the fact that we were able to pass the peace three times, we've been able to get food to older people in our community and the town. Uh, the youth reaching out to the elders has just been tremendous and really has uh, created a, a number of great relationships between those reaching out and those being reached out to uh, and just been wonderful. Um, and there's so many more that things have been, been going on here and which we greatly appreciate. Um, Father Peter noted the uh, stress that uh, has been in the community as a result of the pandemic. Uh, that is true for our community, uh, not only nationally, but here our community uh, at St. Mark's, but also there's been tremendous pressure uh, for our clergy and staff uh, during this time period. Uh, and we appreciate your support of them uh, in all of this. And we appreciate your financial support uh, to enable us to help uh, those in need. As Father Peter pointed out, the Rector's Discretionary Fund was utilized uh, extensively uh, this past year. Um, the, the past year, and I'm not talking about the uh, calendar year, but since the uh, last annual meeting, uh, ended up in a very positive note. Uh, some good news here, uh, that this week the church was listed on the National Register of Historic Places uh, as a result of years of effort. Uh, I wanna thank you, Lee Cromwell. And it's a tremendous testimony to Richard Thomas, who was so integrally involved uh, and getting that designation uh, and who uh, was buried uh, yesterday. Uh, but just a great testimony to him, a testament to him. Uh, this upcoming year, as Father uh, Peter mentioned uh, in his sermon, we'll be addressing the issue of racial inequality. Uh, in that regard, I urge you to watch Father, Father Peter's vlog on Jesse Betts, uh, which will give you some insight in, into the, our history uh, here at St. Mark's uh, in, in, in the, these issues. And the Maranatha House Churches will be addressing uh, this, this issue as we go forward. Uh, we have had a regathering task force uh, that has meet, met on a weekly basis. And I wanna give a shout out to Terry Russell here who has been a tremendous assistance to us uh, as we have looked at the, our options and the uh, possibilities of getting back together in church. And as you all know, 
Uh, we now have the service, uh, the church doors open, I should say, for individuals to come in uh, during the week. Uh, but uh, we are continuing to monitor whether or not we will, when we will be able to get back indoors. Uh, we will continue our outdoor services. Uh, right now, we're looking at what we'll be able to do for Easter. I think preliminarily, it is doubtful that we will be inside for Easter, but we will have an outdoor service for sure, much as we did for on Christmas Eve. Um, uh, as Lauren pointed out, we do not have anything budgeted for Mayfair. Uh, we will not have our usual uh, Mayfair with rides, uh, but we're looking forward to an alternative uh, Mayfair. Uh, Mark Th uh, Thorsheim and George Wright and others are already hard at work on this, coming up with different ideas as to how we can uh, get back out there with a Mayfair 2021, the, the revamped Mayfair. Um, and uh, as uh, alluded to uh, by Father Peter and, and Lauren uh, in her remarks, uh, we are preparing a capital and endowment campaign uh, inspired by love to do God's will. Uh, we will be back to you shortly on this. Uh, we believe that this is the right time to do this. It will enable us to continue to provide what we do and to adapt and respond to the uh, changes and challenges uh, uh, presented by the COVID. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I can promise you um, at some point, uh, hopefully in 2021, is that when we're able to get back indoors, uh, we're going to have uh, not only the world's greatest coffee hour resume, but we're going to have the world's greatest happy hour uh, to get everybody back together uh, and celebrate uh, our community and all we do together. So um, with that, uh, I will uh, be quiet. For any of those of, of those of you who have not yet voted, would you please do so? So. Um, uh, Joe can close out the uh, close out the poll, and with that, Father Peter, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thanks, Dan, and thanks for touching so many different bases uh, in your conversation with us all. Uh, and in a moment, we're going to open this up to questions uh, and answers, and I'm going to uh, address one or two of those. But I want to take this opportunity uh, uh, to let everybody know that the executive committee meets weekly. That's Stan uh, in the box here. Mark Thorsheim, who is uh, the junior warden, but is not shown here, uh, and then Lauren Clancy, who is, and Suzanne Harrison, who is the clerk of our vestry, uh, and Jill Sakul is the, the chief of operations here. And this group does a tremendous amount of work. And, and just uh, say that Stan and Mark and Lauren and Suzanne and Jill, we are, we are uh, mega grateful to all of you for the commitment that you make, which is, which is huge. Uh, okay, um, uh, thank you. I just want to touch base. There's been a question or two. Uh, and I, I'm going to just take them on and then I'm going to uh, let some of these other questions go. Uh, Jennifer Bergen asked, what is the new clergy gift? And I just, I'm going to leap in on that one. So uh, in years gone by, uh, the, the St. Mark's had three full-time clergy. Uh, as, as the ministry morphed over time, we found it harder and harder to get to the third uh, clergy person and were unable to get there, uh, staying within our, our budget. And, and we are deeply, deeply committed. Uh, to not overspending our budget into living within that. And so uh, we had two clergy. Uh, this is several years back before Justin and Elizabeth came on. And I would say uh, it was really taxing. The, the size of the ministry is really too big for two people. And if you don't think I look great now, you should have seen me then. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the two clergy gifts came forward. They were anonymous gifts. The first one was for $150,000. The vestry had decided that uh, it was not prudent for us to hire somebody. Uh, because we didn't have enough runway to really uh, uh, to make that 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 third uh, person uh, really last and get embedded in our system, and so another anonymous one hundred fifty thousand dollar gift came, uh, and that fell into the huzzah category, and we were able to move forward. And then I am beyond delighted to say we received another fifty thousand dollars by one of those individuals uh, to uh, sweeten the pot and, and sweeten the ministry of the church. So $350,000 went in uh, to that targeted thing to help us hire uh, to make sure we could have three full-time clergy. And, and really, uh, Father Justin and Father Elizabeth, uh, excuse me, uh, Reverend Elizabeth came on at the same time of sorts. Uh, when we began looking for three clergy, it never occurred to me uh, that our theologian and residents would be interested in this. I uh, was unclear where Justin was. Uh, he was working way on his PhD, and he came to me and said, this is how I would like to do it. And so uh, we are mightily, mightily blessed to have 
uh, these two people with us. I can tell you that you can travel the whole United States and not find two better associate clergy. We are blessed upon blessed uh, to have them. And I'm grateful for the, the people who have given these anonymous gifts. They have made a categorical change in the way that our parish works. We could not be who we are and where we are without having Justin and Elizabeth with us. They are that key to the way the operation works. And part of uh, the endowment and capital campaign that we are looking toward uh, is to shore up uh, the financial foundation Foundation. You heard much that was very, very positive about that, and we are we are so grateful that we have really worked to be prudent through the years to manage that. But going forward, in order for us to to live into that which we cherish, which is the people and the place and the ministry of love that we have, we really are going to need more financial capital, more financial resources uh, for 2022 and beyond. So that is why uh, we are uh, quietly working to prepare such a thing, and we'll come back to you with that. Uh, Jennifer, thank you. Thank you for that question. Okay, um, what I'd like to do also, so uh, in the question box, uh, George has asked the question, do we plan to apply for PPP2? And Lauren, why don't you take- George, thanks for that question. We're exploring all options. Um, we'd love to be able to take advantage of it. So we're looking into it and we'll continue to look into sort of all the programs that are offered this coming year. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks, Lauren. Uh, you know, I really, really appreciate and we are deeply, deeply indebted to you and to Dave Kalal and to Jill, uh, who oversee the, that's the, uh, the, 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 uh, the mother, daughter and Holy Spirit, uh, mother, son and Holy Spirit. I can't quite get the gendering there right, but the three of you are really a great team and have really been wise uh, in leading us forward. Uh, okay, folks. Um, uh, Jill or Justin, are there any other questions? Does anybody have a question where they would like to speak to us and to raise their hand? Because we really, really would like to be in communion uh, and communicate with you. So please bring your issues to us if you have them. Uh, uh, the question from Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> Jennifer, I love your question. Can you share any more details uh, on the revamped Mayfair? I was waiting for that question. Uh, uh, Stan, I'm going to let you handle that. Uh, uh, you've been you've been talking with Mark, and I know. Just to, uh, yeah, I don't know that we have anything quite yet. We're still exploring lots of, of different things um, for this. As I say, uh, Mark Thorsheim and, and George Wright just this past week have started a dialogue on that and reaching out to others. Um, Obviously, the difficulty is going to be uh, in ha being, having people inside, uh, having you know, so the, the our book uh, our book sales might not work. But we're also exploring other possibilities. You know, that some of the things we've talked about and uh, our possibilities of just setting up tents and you go into one tent and it, everything there is ten dollars. Another tent, it's fifty dollars. Uh, that's one thing we're exploring. But if people have, if we're exploring also, obviously, um, uh, you know, the, the holy smokers uh, doing something. Uh, we 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 all need. Some some good brisket and the like from our holy smokers. So uh, that's something that we're we're talking about, thinking about. Uh, and again, any of you who have ideas, suggestions, uh, please reach out to uh, anyone on the vestry uh, and uh, anyone in the vestry, anybody of, of your officers. Uh, we we want to be creative. Uh, you know, as uh, as we've been able to pivot as a church and what we provided, uh, hopefully we can pivot here on Mayfair uh, and come up with a new improved uh, new improved Mayfair. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And I'd also uh, add to that, uh, Mark Thorsheim and George Wright, too, who have incarnated Mayfair <laughs> and mm -hmm. probably have terrible backs from carrying uh, equipment around and uh, furniture. But uh, if you have any any uh, thoughts on that, uh, please share it with those guys, too. They, they're, they're, they're all in business for that. I think Jill would want me to say that we're not going to be taking any new furniture this year. Uh, that uh, So please, uh, uh, that's not going to happen, but you know, we, will see, we will see what we can do otherwise. Uh, within within the Mayfair context. Yes, we caused a major backlog of furniture movement in the town of New Canaan and book movement uh, as, as people have not been able to dump their, their furniture in the books here. We, are, we do receive calls uh, about this. And, and for those of you who are out in the community, if your friends are asking, are we taking books and furniture? And the answer is no.
while we're waiting to see if there's another question, uh, Jill, would you like to pull up the uh, result of the vote and the resolution? Uh, there we go. So uh, we have 99% yes, and I love the one person who abstained. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, that means that the uh, uh, the vestry uh, and the nominating committee uh, and the diocesan and delegates will stay in place. We are particularly grateful to you for that. And I, I, I want you to know how much work went into this and we're grateful to Stan and his leadership here. Uh, Stan, as you may or may not know, is one of the leading lawyers in the state of Connecticut and way beyond the state of Connecticut, I might also add, uh, but uh, has uh, graciously invited some of his uh, friends from his law firm to give us uh, free legal advice on, on, on our bylaws and on the constitution and canons of the church and whether or not this was possible. We were leaders in the Episcopal Church in Connecticut in this as a step forward. These are, these are very unusual times and the vestry has worked very hard to understand uh, endemic and how we as a pair start to shift and to move it would be very, very difficult to bring people into that conversation, particularly in the way that we would vote. It would be um, uh, potentially very hurtful uh, to those uh, who were not received and called. And there's in the, in the absence of face-to-face, -face, I'm, I'm very sure that we as a community have done the right thing at this point. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful for the vestry uh, for their devotion. We've had many, many more meetings together uh, to try to sort out the way forward here. Um, uh, I, there's a uh, Bill's question uh, I, I receive over on the side. Uh, uh, Bill's question. Let me just pull it up here. Uh, Bill Landis. Yes, thanks. Um, uh, after Gray Gables, uh, what is the next uh, greatest deferred maintenance issue that we face? Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, uh, I'm trying to think who who would best take on that. Um, oh, Jill. Uh, Jill is best to take that on. I don't, Jill, can we hear you? Can you're the administrator? There she is. I think you can hear me. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. I came out from behind the screen. Um, Bill, thanks for the great question. Uh, I would say it falls into a couple of categories. Um, so, you know, there's all the rest of the parking lot that's been waiting 15 or 20 years to be paved. Um, so eventually we've got to get to that, which we'll probably do in pieces uh, over time. Um, you know, I, there are uh, uh, in terms of big projects, I think that we will, uh, we're hoping to see natural gas come up on Oak Ridge. Um, and when that happens, that might be a good trigger for us to uh, replace a very, very old boiler and system of controls in the church and the parish hall so that we can be way, way, way more energy efficient. Um, so th that would be another uh, good option. Um, you know, I mean, these are things that are just coming to the ends of their natural lives and not so much deferred as just they come in their time. Um, some of the other projects we will eventually um, have um, uh, the Raridos uh, conservation uh, attention paid to it. Um, and we are uh, finishing um, phase, a phased replacement of the sound system in the church so that when we're back inside the church, uh, the sound will be all good. So those are just a, a few of the things that are on our radar. Thank you, Joe. So there are two other questions in there that, that have been asked. Jill Ernst has asked the question about replacing the stained glass windows. Uh, and uh, Jill Scalas, would you perhaps try to answer that? Sure. Um, Jill, we actually um, optimistically have that scheduled in the capital plan for this year. Um, and uh, so we'll, uh, we're working towards that. The other thing, if you all heard, uh, as Stan mentioned, we recently got our listing on the National Historic Register which does uh, give us access to state historic preservation grants, which will fund up to 50% of some projects of that type. Um, and so I, the property committee is already uh, sort of preparing to apply for a grant um, to do that project. Uh, so we're excited about that. Yeah, I agree when we're outside, it would be nice to see the stained glass better. Um, and while I've, while I've got the microphone, um, Skip, thanks for your question. Uh, you've caught me, I haven't done the calculation um, uh, recently, so I have to sort of calculate what we didn't spend. Um, but uh, 
you know, in the original calculations, it was about uh, five or six or seven thousand dollars a year we expected to save. So I'm happy to follow back with you uh, after I get back from vacation and give you a firmer number on that if you like. And, and the question that was asked, Jill, was speaking of energy efficiency, uh, how has the solar power program reduced the church's electric bill? Just, just so, oh. I don't know that everybody could see it. Oh, of course. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Um, and uh, so Jono asked, um, are the solar panels covering our electric costs or nearly? So the solar panels generate um, enough energy over the course of the year to offset about 50% of the electricity that's used on the main campus. Thank you, Joe. Uh, just a, a, a word about what's unfolding here. I just wanna note, um, uh, that Jill behind the screen is a little bit the way the operations of the church work. Uh, you might see the people of cholera out front. I can tell you, uh, uh, the, without Jill behind the screen uh, as the director of operations, I don't think you can find another better one across the country. And I know a whole slew of them, uh, and they have great, great respect for the work that Jill does uh, with us. And, and she works, she works without ceasing to. Uh, you know, out of a vocational desire to make uh, the Lord's work at our church go. So thank you for that, Jill. I also want to say how grateful uh, I slash we all are to Bill Landis, who oversees our endowment and investment committee and uh, worked very closely uh, with Dave Kalal this past year to do fantastic work there. Uh, and that we are blessed to have Kathleen Corbett on the, uh, the diocesan committee uh, where all the funds are, are pooled. And so we have great, great expertise on this committee. I mean, uh, ridiculous, uh, ridiculously wonderful expertise for a church our size and uh, grateful to everybody there. I also want to note that in the questions uh, that I'm delighted to see that uh, Alicia Carter has uh, made a comment about Mayfair and that Jono has asked a question I just say that uh, Alicia lives in Colorado and John o lives in Massachusetts. Uh, and so here we are. This is a living example of the new parish church movement that I was talking about uh, in, the, in the sermon today. And we are delighted and blessed to have these people who we love as still part of us. So thank you, everybody, for that. Again, uh, you know, if there are questions, um, raise your hand or let us know. Okay, friends, um, why don't we just take a moment um, and set our heart on quiet uh, and take a deep breath. Uh, it has been an incredible year uh, since the last time we gathered in person, uh, and uh, we have undoubtedly an incredible year before us. Uh, in our quiet, can we please pray um, for all those in our community who have died and that we lost during the past year? Uh, can we pray, please pray for uh, those in our community who are particularly on the front lines in service. I'm, I'm uh, reminded of uh, Duke Beecher uh, down at Stanford Hospital. I'm also reminded of, uh, of uh, Wendy Hillbolt and Jane Hetherington uh, in their EMS work, and they, they led the parade yesterday uh, uh, as the cars came by Edith Linger uh, for her vestry commendation. Uh, let us uh, pray for the youngest in our communities. Uh, our community in Christ here, and let us pray for our oldest. Uh, Edith is is our, our standard bearer, um, and let us pray also uh, for the state of the world. So um, in quietude, let us set our hearts on our Lord. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things that were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. 
Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Now on this Sabbath day, go and make disciples who live a deeper life in Christ, a more holy communion with one another, and a greater love for the world. Okay, folks, God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, may the Lord's spirit continue to bless us all and bless the households in which you dwell. Take care. Thank you.